Hello, Dr. Kovacs. Good morning. How are you doing? Hey, good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm good doing absolutely. Day, yes? yes, everything's fine. I hope you're doing safe as well and everything's fine in New York as well. Yeah, everything's great here. You know, we're trying to figure it all out like everyone else with the lockdown, but overall, everything's good. That's amazing. Are you, are you like uh, allowed to go out as well or are you staying put? Yeah, no, we've got some flexibility. So, you know, we, we can go outside, get exercise, but again, be smart and cautious and, you know, social distance, wear masks, things like that. Right. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Kovacs. Before we start the interview, uh, you know, the entire Indian tennis fraternity, be it parents, coaches, all the strength and conditioning coaches, we, we thank you and we're so looking forward to, you know, like hear you talk. So, I mean, I was just preparing the entire introduction about how should I go about introducing you? And there are so many things. I thought if I keep introducing you like the way, the sort of work that you've done, you know, in the past and you're doing it in the present, I mean, it'll just take away the entire time. But the reason, you know, I love talking to you is, uh, you know, be it, in the university, in an academic setting, or be it practical, you're the perfect person because you've been an athlete yourself. You've played the sport. And, uh, you know, you can actually connect the dots between theoretical knowledge, you know, through your research versus tennis. So just a little, little bit about, you know, if you can just take us through uh, a little bit uh, of work that you've done in the past and, you know, about... COVAX Performance Institute. Hello? Yes. Yeah, good. Am so, I audible? Yeah, it was off a little bit. Okay, that's better. Great. So I was just asking you, you know, if, if you can just take, take us through a little bit about, uh, you know, yourself and talk about the sort of work that you've done in the past, in the present, and more about, uh, you know, the brilliant article and the content that you've been sharing on COVAX Institute. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, I've been fortunate. I, w I grew up as a player, played uh, the junior Grand Slams, um, played a lot of the ITF junior circuit, went to college in the US, won an NCAA title there, uh, then played professionally for a short period of time, had a lot of shoulder problems. Um, and that's what got me into this whole field of sports science, strength and conditioning, tennis training, how do we improve biomechanics, and um, started as a strength coach, uh, worked in other sports, NFL sports, NBA, Major League Baseball, things like that. Uh, and then got into the research world, really interested in the why. Why are we doing the exercises we're doing? Why do injuries happen? Things like that. So started studying that, did my PhD in that area, uh, and then had an opportunity to work with the US Tennis Association to head up their sports science, strength and conditioning, uh, and then over time also directed their coaching education programs. So I spent about six years there working with the best U.S. players in the world. You know, traveled for two years with John Isner, uh, worked with Madison Keys, Sloan Stevens, some of, some of these players that are doing great now, but they were all juniors, you know, at the time. Um, so saw their development, then worked with Gatorade, directed the Gatorade Sports Science Institute. That was uh, one of the biggest sports science institutes in the U.S., um, and then also had a role at PepsiCo as well. So that opened up a lot of other opportunities related to sport technology, related to wellness, sleep, nutrition, things in that, those spaces. Uh, then have set up the COVAX Institute about six years ago. Uh, and, you know, that was to really focus on better educating coaches and players. And we would have uh, players come in for assessments using technology to improve training, biomechanics, things like that. Uh, so also a uh, set up of nearly about eight years ago now with a, a few other professionals in the field, the International Tennis Performance Association. It's a trade association focused on individuals that are working with tennis athletes in sports science and tennis fitness. So that's tennis coaches, 
strength coaches, athletic trainers, physical therapists, chiropractors, medical doctors, and it's three levels of education. And it's really one of the best sources out there for anyone that works in tennis on how to train them physically to improve performance and reduce the likelihood of injury. Amazing. That's, that's a really rich experience, you know, and we're looking for like a great discussion on various topics. Uh, especially, you know, coming back to the education part, because I am myself, uh, you know, a CTPS, a certified tennis performance specialist from your institute. And, you know, I'm glad that I, I, I love the content, first of all. Uh, the first question I actually want to ask is, you know, there are a bunch of po- trainers out there. Uh, you know, people really don't understand the fact that what exactly is evidence-based practice, you know, they don't. Uh, so if you can just talk about what exactly is the difference between somebody throwing an opinion versus an actual evidence-based practice. Yeah, it's a really important d- distinction because everyone has an opinion. It doesn't mean your opinion is based in fact. So evidence-based practice means there is evidence that what you're doing actually improves performance or reduces the likelihood of injury in what we're talking about. What exercises are you doing at what time for the certain individual and will it actually help them improve their performance? So a lot of players, like like you said, get training and many times that training doesn't have a specific focus. They may do a series of eight to 10 exercises that are random that don't specifically improve that athlete's performance and could potentially increase their risk of injury. Uh, it's not the exercise fault. It, there's very few exercises that are bad. Uh, I've used nearly every exercise available at some point with a certain athlete, but many exercises are wrong for that specific athlete at that time, at that stage in their development. So it's really important to utilize evidence as best you can to structure your programming to optimize your player's performance. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. I was just listening to, uh, you know, uh, Michael Boyle as well, wherein he said, you know, there are no bad exercises. What you exactly have to work on is the coaching aspect of it, which you, uh, you know, absolutely nailed it. The second it's thing that... It's important that question is, it's a risk reward discussion is what it is. Right. It's what is the risk of that movement for that athlete? Let's say if you've got shoulder impingement issues, you're probably not going to be pressing overhead doesn't mean overhead pressing is a bad movement. It means for that individual that has bad shoulder function, you're going to put them in a position that could uh, create more problems than it helps. So that's yeah. one example. But that, you can do that for just about every movement. There's certain times where those movements are great and other times where they should be completely avoided. Absolutely. I think, uh, you know, uh, I've seen a lot of times when I went, when we enter the gym, you know, an athlete who absolutely lacks uh, shoulder flexion, but still is doing some sort of a military press or a overhead pressing. Uh, the idea behind is to actually see and modify it according to the needs of, the, of an athlete, what exactly an athlete is looking out for and how would uh, a particular exercise would benefit that particular tennis player. Uh, now, you know, coming back to how we go about, you know, designing the program, because uh, a lot of coaches, a lot of trainers, a lot of parents, uh, they have different opinions about, you know, different, uh, about different things. So, of course, you know, like when we talk about sport science or strength and conditioning, we always come across a term called needs analysis, right? which is the most important thing. And if you if we actually go about and if we go go, go if you google your name and needs analysis about tennis the first paper that you know comes online is the physical physiological aspect of uh, you know of the of tennis so if you can just go you know take us through what just give us a gist about what exactly tennis as a sport requires you know in terms of strength in terms of how do you train the aerobic capacity how do you train you know the anaerobic function so if you can just give a gist about that so that it'll be easier for all of coaches, trainers, and other sports scientists to know how we go about designing the program. Yeah, no, it's, it's the real big difference between training 
general athletes versus training specifically for a sport. And training general athletes, you may do very similar movements, very similar exercises, whether they're football players, whether they're rugby players, whether they're cricketers, whether they're tennis players. That'll get you a base level of training. You know, it's not saying that's bad. It's just limited. It's limited in how good that athlete can be because it's general training. Tennis specific training requires, like you said, a needs analysis of what does that sport need, which is step one. You've got to understand the sport. It's mainly anaerobic, meaning that most points are very short. We know majority of points are less than four shots. 60 to 70% of all points are less than four shots at every level of tennis, from professional to collegiate to junior. There's not much variability there. That doesn't mean that there aren't longer points. There's 30% of points that are longer. But majority of points are shorter. So you've got to train physically to be as explosive as possible, as fast as possible, and change of direction as well as you can in those movements. Also, a tennis court tells you your distance. Why train anything longer distance-wise than a tennis court distance that you would be? You know? So in general, you know, 36 feet is the width of a tennis court, doubles line to doubles line. So you may go 50 to 70 feet maximum if you're covering very long distance on a court. So why ever run anything longer than that? So that's a question. Also, if you do run longer than that at a fast pace, let's say a 100 meter sprint or a 200 meter sprint, there's actually some very significant increase in risk there for a tennis player. Why? Because they never train like that. They never get into full stride or full, uh, you know, maximum velocity running mechanics, which puts more strain on the lower back and the hamstring and things like that. So you have to ask yourself, maximum velocity sprinting is great for rugby. It's great for soccer. It's great for a lot of sports that have long distances to travel and you need that. But for tennis, everything we do is acceleration and then deceleration. Start quickly, stop quickly. That's how we need to train. In the gym, we know we have to do a needs analysis on the body. We know that the shoulder is very inflexible for most people this way, internal shoulder rotation. That's limited in every tennis player compared to a non-tennis player. Or compared to that, if I'm a right-hander, my internal rotation here is more restricted than my internal rotation here. So that's an area you know you need to work on. We know that hip flexors are very tight because we get into an athletic position, a ready position on every point, and that shortens our hip flexors. So those are just some examples of why you need to do a needs analysis on the sport. That's the first one. The second is then the needs analysis on that specific athlete. Every athlete's different. Some athletes are genetically faster than others. They're genetically taller than others. They're genetically you know, built a certain way, or they've been trained at a young age to have a better forehand than a back end. So you may need to work on the back end if they want to go to the next level. So those are all things that go into your needs analysis. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, these days, you know, people really, like the physios, we've been talking to a lot of people, they, they've been really focusing on, uh, you know, a lot of asymmetry, but it's pretty natural because it's a right hand, it's, 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 you know, right or left hand dominant sport. So you're bound to have you know, some sort of uh, limitations on either side, you know, of your joint. Uh, and also... Yeah, I mean, asymmetries, uh, asymmetries is an important discussion because you want asymmetries in tennis. That's adaptation to the sport. And there can be positive asymmetries and negatives. Don't, you don't want to mess with the positive asymmetries. The negative ones that could increase risk, those have to be addressed. But in general... You know, tennis has asymmetries for a benefit. It's an adapt positive adaptation to the sport. So you have to be careful how you address the asymmetries. Absolutely. So what do you mean to say, uh, Dr. Kovacs here, is that, you know, we would see uh, for a right-hand dominant player, there, should be, there will be some sort of, you know, internal rotation deficit. So you mean to say that we shouldn't stretch that joint anymore or should we just not aim at getting the same ranges on you know, the non-dominant side. Is that what correct. you mean to say? Yeah, correct. You definitely don't right. want to have a significant limitation there, but you've got to understand that that adaptation is protective to some extent. It's the way right. that the shoulder can decelerate 
uh, and it and it is a way that it allows it to go through a somewhat limited range of motion on purpose, meaning that you want you don't want to have extreme ranges to know what the ranges are. But we and then we saw that we're Range of motion allows for sometimes more stability. Remember, when you increase range of motion many times, you increase instability. So we have to understand, is it a mobility issue or is it a stability issue? Many times, getting really good at one may limit the other part of that coin. So we have to be careful with that. So really good point. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, the third question, which is, you know, very closer for strength and conditioning coaches is, uh, you know, when you go on court, you, you might see uh, the coaches yelling that, you know, stay low and hit the ball, stay low and hit the ball. But, uh, you know, we as strength and conditioning coaches or, uh, you know, sports science practitioners, we always think about the skill part of the sport and the capacity part of the sport. So can you just take us through or explain us a little bit in detail that why a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old or a 14-year-old will not be able to go down and hit the shot unless he's developed a certain amount of capacity in his legs or in his shoulder or throughout, you know, different joints. Yeah, no, it's, it, there's a strength issue with any movement. If you don't have requisite strength, you're not going to be able to stabilize well enough. So you need to have a base level of strength in the positions we're talking about not general strength, but specific strength to those movements. That's why if you're in the weight room and you just do squats, for example, we know a lot of athletes that squat really well, a lot of weight, but you put them on a tennis court and they don't do very well in their wide balls because that's not where they're squatting. If you're going into a side lunge movement for a wide forehand, that's a very different mechanical movement than a two-legged traditional squat in a weight room. So they may be able to squat to 300 kilos, which is really a, a lot of weight, but they can't handle their own body weight at high velocities when they have to decelerate out wide for a forehand. So that's a really important differential there. We need specifically for the movement, which uh, you know doesn't always happen, unfortunately. You know, it, you know, there's there's a lot of training that goes on that is very general which again, like we said earlier, is useful for sure, but it's limited because it doesn't hit all the positions on the court that a tennis player needs. Right, right. Absolutely. So what do you mean to say is that spotting is absolutely important, but positional specific strength is also something which is very, very important. You can be, you know, you can squat for maybe 200 pounds or 250 pounds, but if it doesn't help you to, you know, get in those positions, it generally doesn't mean that there is some sort of a transfer on the court. So that is Correct. what we as coaches should you know, aim for. Yeah, there's a specificity to training that needs to be applied, um, especially as you get higher and higher in the level of tennis that we're talking about. At lower levels of tennis, you can be a bit more general um, because the speed of the game is not as fast, the distances covered per movement aren't as wide, the ability to decelerate as quickly isn't as high. So you've got all these factors that you can get away with more general. But as you move up the level, it gets harder and harder and harder to compete with the best in the world at what you do. Right. Absolutely. Uh, the other question, which is, uh, which, which is a little funny and, you know, always uh, I get this question a lot from the parents that my kid is 10 year old, should my kid be hitting the gym or not because, uh, you know, there is a general misconception amongst the parents that if a kid hits the gym, uh, they might just, uh, you know, stunt their growth. So what's your take on it, doctor? Yeah, so there's, a, I mean, we studied this for years, not just me, but hundreds of really good researchers around the world. And, you know, there was a misconception about a small study in West Virginia, probably in the 50s or 60s, that looked at coal miners, people that worked in the coal mines, and that they were lifting a lot of weight and they were shorter people um, as a result. And that's where some of this misconception about lifting weights came from. It didn't take into account 12 to 40. 
14 hours a day with no sunlight, which we know vitamin D is really important for growth. They had very bad nutrition habits, meaning they weren't eating, they were malnutrition. Um, and and the, it wasn't like structured strength training. So all the studies since then that have been well-designed, um, that have you know looked at strength training in youth, hasn't shown a... You know, uh, result in uh, stunted growth or, or people being shorter. However, we do have to understand that incorrect lifting technique at a young age can be very problematic or lifting too much weight for a young skeleton could potentially be problematic. So there, you have to be smart about what you're doing, but a 10 year old should be lifting. What we mean by lifting is mainly body weight, bands, five, 10 pound dumbbells, they're not going to be lifting 100, 200, 300 pound weights, but they're going to be doing those similar movements with age and stage of development appropriate resistance, which allows them to learn technique, develop stability that they need. And then as they get older and stronger, that's going to progressively increase in a structured and planned way. Right, right. Actually, even I had read, uh, you know, a research which said that uh, first of all, a good quality coach, you know, if if uh, environment or the weight room is a pretty much controlled environment compared to the chaos that occurs. Nice. So, so that's a great point. Yeah, no, I would agree with you 100%. Yeah, there's way more risk, honestly, in many younger athletes playing tennis in an uncontrolled environment, meaning that their coaches are asking them to hit too many tennis balls. They're out there for three or four hours. Bad technique. Um, that is a risk as well potentially a higher risk than being in a weight room in a controlled environment with age and stage appropriate resistance. So it's like going back to that exercise question. Exercise, the exercises by themselves are not really the problem. It's how are they being applied? Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, uh, another question that, you know, always bothers me is, uh, how much time does a kid should devote uh, or, you know, let me put this across. Where in, you know, an athlete or a tennis player is already doing a lot of on court movements. Is there a necessity to specifically work on court when it comes to movements separately except for tennis? And how much time an athlete should dedicate in the gym rather? Yeah, really important question and something we discuss a lot. Even at the highest levels of tennis, you discuss at the pro level is how much extra movement training should they be? So it all, all depends on the skill of the tennis coach. If the skilled tennis coach is proficient in movement, then they should be able to do most of it on the court. Um, if they're not very, unfortunately, aren't, they're not skilled in training tennis movement. Um, then the off-court or non-tennis hitting sessions need to be more prioritized on tennis movement. However, tennis movement is highly technical, just like stroke development is, and most players and most strength coaches aren't that well trained in tennis movement. So the folks that want to learn a little bit more, go to the ITPA website, the International Tennis Performance Association website. There's a free workbook there that goes through all the major tennis movements. This was a project we did a couple of years ago where we put together about 30 or so of the most utilized tennis movements. And it helps educate folks about what they are so that you're on the same language from a strength coach, physical training standpoint with the tennis coach. And that's a way that everyone can communicate together. Absolutely. I think I read that. Uh, I, I read that the common language, uh, you know, for yeah. football fat and that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's an amazing source because we've been discussing with the coaches and, uh, you know, I've got a couple of people who work with me. So we've been, it's helpful because now everybody knows what exercise and what movement are we working on. So uh, that's, that's really amazing work. 
the second quest or uh, you know or another question that i would like to ask it's which i read on the covax institute uh when measuring forces so every player might produce 600 to 700 newtons of force uh you know while serving but the top player who serving 150 miles are the ones who producing 1500 newtons of force which uh, takes me back to the importance of maximal strength training you know not even just lifting 50% of your max or 40% of your max but the imp- getting very strong is really helpful in tennis for a lot of factors it's not only great for like you said serving at a high speed and using ground reaction forces really well but it's also really valuable when you need to stop explosively or decelerate very quickly so those are the big areas where that higher level strength close to maximal strength becomes really important the the concern is you go every time you get closer to maximal strength you get closer to potentially injury risk so you have to balance that with how often do you go there when in the season when in your trainings do you go to that point and how do you incorporate that that's where periodization for tennis becomes so important you can't li- lift very heavy all year round it's it's not smart to do that and it won't give you the best results you have to structure your year where you will have periods where you work on that then you have periods where you come off that a little bit and you work on a different area but we need to be smart about it but you do you want to get as strong as possible understanding in a, it has to be done in a safe way and progressed appropriately absolutely i think you spoke about periodization you know it's it's a very debatable topic when it comes to a sport wherein uh, you know the the off season is is not for more than 4 weeks uh for us as coaches it becomes very difficult to you know periodize for the entire year because you know the players always traveling uh the challenge we face is that yes uh it's easier compared to the elite player to periodize because uh the juniors are, you know are much more in the academy they don't play so much compared to the elite uh, uh tennis athletes but uh how do you sort of balance things off because Uh, you know how do you sort of recommend when a tennis player is traveling uh how, what's the load that you have to prescribe how do you assess uh you know the power has gone down or the strength factor has gone down and accordingly you know prescribe different loads while a player is traveling on tour and there's always a certain dilemma amongst the players because they are scared to lift weights and they think that if they lift weights uh mind you i'm talking about raising the intensity but not the volume so they always think that you know i will not be recovered for for the another you know tennis match or for the for another day so how do you solve this problem yeah so it really shouldn't be a problem i a lot of people are scared by it they don't know exactly how to program for it but this is the area i probably spent one of the largest amounts of time in over the last 15 years mainly with pros and elite juniors that are transitioning to the professional game about how to structure their weeks and their months you know because it can be done very easily but you have to apply what i call tennis specific periodization which is different than block periodization or traditional periodization which is hey we're going to work on strength for four weeks or six weeks then we're going to work on power for six weeks then we're going to work on muscular endurance you actually have to do everything just about in every week because you don't know your schedule that's the hardest part with tennis in most environments is if you win you keep playing matches if you lose you may have a week you may have three weeks depending on your schedule before your next tournament so you can't plan out every workout like when i was working in other sports team sports you could plan out a month of workouts because you know your training days you had your games so in tennis you have to have a you know it's called nonlinear periodization uh, i call it tennis specific because you're trying to structure it around your tennis matches um but you would have a power day you would have a strength day you'd have a muscular endurance day 
those are in every work every week you have those three days and then depending on the level you may have a tennis specific endurance day where it's more conditioning based uh, and then you may have a secondary day depending on who you are which is what you may need to work on if it's strength you may have a second strength day if it's hey that person doesn't doesn't do so well from an endurance standpoint it may be a muscular endurance perspective day so that's how you structure it and then you just alternate your volume and intensity based on where they are in their tournament that week or if they've got multiple weeks off before the next tournament you can raise your volume progressively and it makes it pretty easy if you have a good structure to it like you said the biggest question is you have to convince the player that they have to train through events we use a three-step system of de determining events Priority one events are the most important events of the year for that player. Uh, priority two are kind of lead-in events for those really important tournaments or other tournaments they really want to do well. But we know we still got to, you know, use as a bit of three events, uh, just like a practice match would be at your academy or your club. You're playing a tournament, but you're completely training through it. You're doing workouts before and maybe after, and you're using that as practice matches. So priority, you're not going to do heavy strength for extended volume. You're going to have very limited weight room kind of environments there. It's just going to be for priming the body to make sure it's ready to perform. You're going to spend a lot more time on recovery. Priority two is a hybrid. You're going to train that week pretty well, but you're not going to push it like crazy. Priority three is you're going to train harder with a goal of performing under fatigued environment, which is acceptable because training under fatigue needs to happen at certain times throughout the year as well. So if you have that structure, it makes it relatively easy then to plan week to week and month to month. Absolutely. Uh, also, you know, because you just mentioned about fatigue and, uh, you know, I've been reading your paper on how the accuracy decreases uh, because of violation of fatigue. So, so it's very important that, you know, yes, you've got, we are fatigued, we've played a long match, but we also need to understand that unless and until we don't push the barrier, we won't be able to increase the capacity, of, you know, of that particular, of that particular parameter. So how important is it to, to train under fatigue, you know, especially uh, you've played a long match and you're fatigued, but you still want to train and it's difficult sometimes, you know, as opposed to convince that you still have to go, out, go hit the gym and train. Yeah, so training under fatigue is really, really important, but it also increases injury risk if it's done incorrectly. So that's why you have to be smart about what you're doing. You have to have a basic way of monitoring when they do start getting fatigued. What does that look like? How are you testing that? How are you monitoring that? And then what are you going to do when they do get fatigued? Certain days you do want them to stop and rest because you want them to recover well enough for the next training session. Other days, you know, they're going to be a bit fatigued and you're going to be like, now I want you to compete and play three games under this fatigue state to try to simulate a second match in a tournament day. And it's four on the third set. Your legs are gone. Your mind's a little fried. You're not really fully engaged as much as you should be. And now you've got to compete and try to win. Because if you never train for that, why would you expect a player to do really well in tournament situations when that environment happens, which it will? Absolutely. That's, that's well said. So I think it's a great message for all the tennis players and coaches who are watching. That training under fatigue is the most important part because if, you, if you know, you're three set four all into the match and you're not ready for that situation, uh, it'll be difficult for you to succeed from there. That's a great point. Uh, you, you know, the other question that I want to actually I want to ask a lot of questions, but uh, we've got uh, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, we, we, we'll come back to recovery. I think we're getting a few questions about, you know, recovery. Uh, so, you know, especially it's a it's a challenge because when you're traveling, uh, you sometimes when we talk about, of course, recovery, we're talking about compression garments, we're talking about ice baths, we're talking about contrast showers. But uh, not always, when you're not ranked higher, will you get all these facilities in a hotel or in a club. 
So what do you think is the best, uh, you know, form of recovery so that uh, the athlete, you know, again, is fresh the next day for the other match? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And there's two, there's more than two, but there's components of recovery that you have to be aware of. One is reducing inflammation, which is what cooling techniques will do. Ice baths, you know, and things like that, icing. So that shuts off your blood flow to a certain extent. It gives an analgesic response, which means it takes a bit of the pain away. If you've got tired legs or sore knees or something, you won't feel that for a period of time because you've numbed the area. However, in the short term, you may feel an immediate benefit. It feels better because you don't feel anything. But we know over the longer period, it actually hurts your recovery over time. So it's much more preferred, and the data is supporting this, that you want to get blood flow to the area as much as possible. So that would be heating things up. That would be uh, you've got these various compression-type environments that allow you to pump blood in and out, uh, boots and, and different things now that are quite common. The other thing I use a lot is electrical muscle stimulation. So it just allows for the muscle to pump consistently, blood flow in, and then you move the deoxygenated blood out and it continues to bring in oxygenated blood to the area that you want. It could be your quads, it could be your calves, it could be your lower back. Wherever it is that that athlete is looking to help recover faster and better, you want to use those techniques. If you don't have access to some of those technologies, shower. Water is one of the best things and most people have availability to do a shower. So a hot shower can play a role and then also a contrast meaning that you go from hot to cold going from hot to cold what it does is a cold shower will you know um, constrict vasoconstrict everything so it will reduce blood flow for a short period and then the moment you turn the hot water on again and you have a hot shower immediately after a cold it'll then help that blood rush back to the area and it'll be a pumping and you go back from hot to cold to hot to cold and that's an easy strategy that just about everyone has access to. So that would be one of the most common ones I'd recommend. Amazing. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Kovacs, you worked uh, with, you know, John Isner for two weeks. Uh, just give us a little bit of, uh, you know, if you can let us know if it's a priority to, you know, prior to two week tournament, how would a typical day with John Isner look like? Yeah, so, I mean, I've been fortunate to work with a lot of different players. So I, I traveled with John for two years. Uh, I've, I've worked with Riley Opelka, you know, so two of the tallest players ever to play tennis. Uh, Francis Tiafo I traveled with for a long time as well. Um, and they're all different players. So when you are talking about what does each player look like, it's going to be very different. You know, John was really a great professional when it comes to taking care of his body, understanding the importance of daily work daily body maintenance and that's why he's had such a successful and long career being as tall as he is he's hardly been injured in his 12 year career or so even though he's had a lot of challenges he's been dealing with all sorts of stuff and you know he's been able to manage it by his commitment and his discipline to daily work also he would lift weights nearly every day he'd be in the gym before matches lifting he'd be in the gym after matches lifting in different ways so that's a great example riley opelka similar you know you know he, he, he there's all these players do it differently um some of them spend a lot of extra time in the gym before and after other players prefer to have their gym sessions on non-playing days and there's nothing wrong with both those strategies a lot of it is feel for the athlete so you have to work with them as long as they're getting their volume in that they need and it's structured in a way so and i work with players their programs are so different it's amazing how different a program may be for a john isner versus say a francis tiafo versus someone else who's just coming up uh on tour you know so it's where that needs analysis goes in and yeah. like you mentioned it's really important Absolutely. that the needs analysis is done and that you personalize your programs Right. Absolutely. I think it's very important, as you said, to, to have like a personalized program because uh, especially at the top level, one size doesn't fit all. There'll be, you know, different qualities of different players that a, a strength and conditioning coach has to work with. Uh, so we're getting a few questions, Dr. Kovacs. 
I mean, one of the questions being asked is by Karnika. Uh, he, he's asking, should a tennis player stretch right after a match or after their training session? Yeah, so uh, most definitely. Tennis is a tough sport. You, your body gets beat up pretty good playing and practicing. You want to have structured flexibility and mobility time periods. And immediately after you play is a great time. One is the body's still warm, so it's easier to get a fuller range of motion. Two is most tennis movements restrict mo movement, um, meaning that you're tightening up as you play. So immediately stretching it back out to a normal length is really important because we know from the research studies done on various, if you play tennis, you restrain your motion, whether it's it's in your shoulder, whether it's in your hip, anywhere between 5 and 10% from before you play to after you play. So that comes back over a 24 to 48 hour period normally, but it comes back just a little bit less each time. So if you're not stretching it back out to normal over the course of a year or two years or three years, we see a decrease in range of motion in tennis players. So that's why stretching immediately afterwards is so valuable. Right. Any tips on how, how long should you hold the stretch for? You know, usually because uh, we've also, you know, uh, read papers wherein it has been said that uh, static stretching can also be at times uh, detrimental for, you know, for performance. And uh, so, so that is why, you know, yoga is a controversial topic that, you know, all the players holding the stretch or holding that pose for you know, maybe a minute or two minutes or two and a half minutes. What do you think? How long should a, a stretch be? Number one and number two, is yoga really helpful? You know, is Toes, you know, touch your toes and hold for 30 seconds to two minutes, more similar to some traditional yoga poses. And then you have dynamic stretching, which is go through full ranges of motion with some load and you're active the entire time. That is more recommended before you play because that type of stretching, dynamic flexibility, dynamic range of motion provide better benefits for strength, speed and power activities immediately following. You don't want to recommend static stretching before you play tennis, but static stretching after is fine. It doesn't impact, you know, the next day. It usually only impacts your results for about 45 minutes to an hour after you do it. So that's where yoga can be really beneficial. But it has to be done at the right time. You don't want to do it an hour before you go play tennis. You want to do it after you play at a separate time that evening, things like that. So, um, anything that gets a tennis player to stretch the right way is going to be beneficial as long as it's done at the right time. The one risk that you, you have in yoga is if it's not done in a tennis specific way, you actually may overstretch areas that are already flexible and understretch areas that aren't flexible enough. So general yoga poses sometimes can put an athlete at greater risk. For example, lumbar, you don't necessarily want to overstretch the lumbar region. Um, so some yoga poses go quite extreme into those positions. So you have to, like everything else, it's not the exercise fault. Is, is it appropriate? Absolutely. I think a lot of parents, uh, you know, would, would definitely ask that should my uh, daughter or should my son be doing yoga? So this is a very important takeaway that it has to be balanced. You know, it. you need to create a lot of stability along, uh, along the joint, but at the same time, you don't want the joint to be more flexible, which also creates, uh, you know, a lot of instability in that particular joint. Right? Uh, we're getting a few more questions. If you are doing mobility, yeah, it's important to remember, if you're doing a lot of stretching and a lot of mobility, you better be doing a good amount of strengthening at the same time to make sure that strength in those new ranges of motion are appropriate. If you just do right. flexibility with no strengthening, that is also it increases risk as well. Right. right. That's a great question. Uh, 
also one more thing i'm getting you know mm-hmm. another question about the use of foam rollers you know should foam should is foam roller enough for myofascial tissue okay i think what is trying to ask is that uh, how is foam roller beneficial you know can we should it be a uh, you know a part of recovery before uh, your warm up or you know after your training session yeah so foam rolling i i don't use a huge amount before activity some people do some people like it a lot um i prefer it a little bit afterwards more for blood flow purposes than anything else um and again there's a lot of different foam rollers out there now um so you have to understand there's heated ones there's vibrating ones there's the traditional ones that have uh, been around a long time and if you're trying to use it for uh general muscle warming um similar to self massage um then it, it provides really good value if you're trying to do it in a more more targeted way there's probably better options out there now whether it's instrument assisted devices whether it's um lacrosse balls or um uh, tennis balls even that you want to get into an area you can target your areas a little bit more nothing wrong with foam rolling but it's a bit limited in how it, it can be utilized right i think there's another question that we're getting i think uh david asked that you know if a kid is playing in a group how can the kid get differentiated or uh, you know his training can be individualized especially with the younger kids with 9 10 and 11 years old Yeah so at that young age general training is usually appropriate because they have to become a generally good athlete so they know have to learn how to jump how to land how to squat how to lunge how to throw how to you know do all those general movements so general training at 6 7 8 9 10 11 even 12 is totally fine as you start moving through 10s 12s 14s then you're going to start doing some more, some more tennis specific stuff and that could still be in a group setting you're going to be doing more shoulder work you're going to be doing more you know uh wide lunging type movements that is more similar to footwork patterns on the tennis court and then at some point depending on your level then you do need to really personalize the programming to make it very specific to each individual athlete so at those young ages group training is fine as long as it's the right type of group training absolutely uh one more it's it's a long debate you know about tennis being an early specialization sport uh what do you think about you know kids who are uh, 6 7 8 and you know till 12 14 the importance of playing multi sport rather than just focusing on you know tennis as their particular sport and if is there any sort of a transfer transferability when it comes to change of direction or agility to the tennis court if they play a different sport Yeah no it's it's a debate that goes on for a long time and it's it's an important one it's pretty simple though T- tennis is an early um it's not an early specialization sport as such some people make it that way um but it's an early exposure sport which is different you want to expose a player to tennis at a very young age as young as you can 4 5 6 7 and you want to have them doing it relatively consistently once or twice a week maybe more you know a uh, a good number of months a year however you also want them to do a lot of other sports because one you want to see what sport they're really good at they may not be great at tennis they may love soccer they may love cricket they may love another sport better and be more passionate about it so normally what i recommend is expose a young player to six sports you know whatever six sports that seem to make sense and they gravitate to and what's available and then you'll very quickly see which two or three they really love and they're really passionate about and then let them play those two or three in a more competitive way try to develop their skills in all three of those and then at some point whether it's 11 12 13 14 you you may have to make a decision okay at this we're going to spend 80% of our time playing tennis. That's a structured way of doing it using some basic strategy rather than hey at 8 years old the parent makes the decision this kid is going to play tennis only. 
that's not the smartest way of going about it. The challenge is you do have a competitive advantage if you specialize very early, meaning that an eight-year-old that plays tennis 20 hours a week is going to be better normally at eight, nine, ten than a tennis player who plays five hours a week you know, and plays a lot of other sports in those other 15 hours. So the challenge becomes you've got to expect that nine-year-old, that 10-year-old, that 11-year-old that plays all these other sports to potentially not have as good of results at eight through 12. However, over the long run, we know that specializing early is not a predictor of being better at 16, 17, 18, 19. So you have to just know that realistically, if you train for something 20 hours a week, you're probably going to be better at it than someone else who trains at it for five hours a week. Right, absolutely. Uh, you know, one more very important question, especially from, from the fem female perspective is, uh, you know, training under menstruation when somebody, when, you know, when an athlete, when especially a female athlete is going through her periods, how do you manage, you know, the training schedule for that particular day, for that particular week? Uh, and what's your take on it? Yeah, so it's a really important area and something that we've tracked and monitored in the female athletes I've worked with for over a decade. And it's so valuable because one, it allows you to structure your weeks and it allows you to structure your schedule. Because if you're smart, and at the pro level, it's a bit hard sometimes because certain big events fall on weeks that aren't appropriate for that athlete to feel like they're, they're, they're at their best and they have to still play through it. But in the junior game, you can actually schedule your events around the menstrual cycle to try to limit when you're playing in environments that you may not be at your best. And then you know how to increase and decrease your volume based on that. Um, so I've worked with... Um, female athletes, the U.S. national soccer team as well. And it's an important discussion point. And the good thing is now it's become a little bit more um, commonplace to talk about. So 10 years ago, people weren't talking about this as much. It was harder to discuss it in a professional way. Now yeah. it's, it should be a component of the needs analysis. Just like you put down when are the major tournaments you want to play, you also want to put down where in the menstrual cycle an athlete is during these periods of training and competition to then build up and reduce based on how they're feeling in those times. Absolutely. I think, I think we're running out of time, but we've got a few more questions. And, you know, one of the most important questions is because times have changed now. Uh, we really don't know... Uh, you know, when the entire thing is going to going, going back to normal. Uh, we've got research, you know, we've got certain parameters to train. When we think about training the power aspect, training the speed aspect, training, you know, the endurance aspect, some of it, yes, we definitely can train, but we've got restrictions now because a lot of people might not have a lot of equipments, you know, at their places. Uh, how do you think, if this is like a more general question, for uh, definitely a lot of, how do you think a lot of general athletes or general tennis players should train versus how an elite player should train? Yeah, because so I right think you'd now, also, yeah, you'd so also right now, done a study. Yeah. Like you said, a lot of, you're limited with equipment. You may not have access to facilities, things like that. So you have to use body weight a lot. You have to use bands um, if you've got, That that's the biggest thing people have. Like you don't need a lot of expensive equipment to train really well. If you've got access to a medicine ball and some bands, you can pretty much do anything you need for a tennis athlete. And that's what I use when I'm on the road with most players. It's great when we get in the gym to do the heaviest strength stuff if needed, dumbbells and barbells and things like that. But in general, as long as I've got some bands and a medicine ball for a tennis athlete, I can do everything I need. So I wouldn't look at this time period as a negative uh, from a training standpoint. It actually is a positive because many players have more time. They have more time to train. They have more flexibility in their schedule. And you just want to plan out what are your goals? What are you trying to improve? Is it strength? Is it power? Is it endurance? How much do we want to improve based on what you can test? You may be able to test a few basic things at home and then say, hey, I'm going to improve this day after day. It could be a wall sit. You get do a wall sit one, and then you say, I want to hold this for three minutes. 
and you hold it for three minutes and you start adding weight, adding books, adding whatever you have at home that can add resistance to you as you do it and try to see how long you can hold. So things like that is what I'm doing with a lot of the athletes I'm communicating with is at home training programs and making them better during this period. Absolutely. So, uh, Dr. Kovacs, also, if you can take us to, you know, you, you know, International Tennis Performance Association, wherein there is, there are a lot of courses for people who are willing to get into strength and conditioning or, you know, I just recently read about the tennis specific uh, performance course, TSS. Uh, so if you can just take us through how, uh, you know, a, some a strength and conditioning course Uh, you know, of tennis or fitness rather. Yeah, so the International Tennis Performance Association, uh, if you put that in, in, in the search engine or go to itpa-tennis.org, uh, there's a lot of great information there. There's a blog there that's free as well. And then we have a member-only website with members in about 45 countries. Uh, and there's a lot of great information there. But there's three levels of education. Level one is usually aimed at the tennis coach. So it's, it, it discusses strength training, movement training, physical testing, nutrition, periodization, planning, injury prevention, all those areas in really good evidence-based detail. Um, and then level two is aimed at the strength and conditioning professional, the athletic trainer, physical therapist, chiropractor, medical doctor, someone that has more anatomical training, tennis type training. Um, and that's called the Certified Tennis Performance Specialist Program. So those are the two main ones through the uh, International Tennis Performance Association. Our level three is our master tennis performance specialist. And that's something that's very unique and uh, by invitation only normally. Uh, and that's for our elite uh, play, uh, folks that have gone through the, the previous levels. Uh, so that's something that really provides great value. And it's really an important aspect. It's really helped a lot of people get jobs as well. Um, there's hundreds of people that have got jobs because they've got this extra level of knowledge. All tennis federations, traveling on the on ATP and WTA, working with top juniors. So it just gives you a confidence that you know how to incorporate what we've been discussing today in the best ways possible. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, Dr. Kovacs, I'm personally a certified tennis performance specialist and I can totally vouch for all the courses that we've mentioned because there are a lot of courses in the market which will give you a general perspective about strength and conditioning. But when it comes to the tennis side of it, of, you know, you, be it nutrition, be it recovery, be it, you know, the different times and actually the different continents the tennis player is traveling at, uh, you know, their training age, how do you modify training, periodization, everything is mentioned, uh, you know, in the content that is delivered by CTPS. Uh, uh, hi, guys. I hope, uh, you know, all the answers, all your answers were actually questioned. Uh, I'm just trying to reconnect with Dr. Kovacs. Sorry, guys, there was a, a little bit of technical glitch and I think we've lost uh, Dr. Kovacs. I'm not unable to connect with him. But uh, I hope all your questions, you know, were answered. And, uh, you know, we hope to see you another time with another live with, with some other amazing coaches around the world. Thank you so much. And I would really like to thank Indian Tennis Daily for uh, giving the opportunity to conduct, uh, you know, this live uh, webinar with Dr. Kovacs. Thanks a lot. Thank you.